good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Mark's Mouthpiece, episode 60. And it is my great privilege today to have the amazing Christian Lindbergh, the living legend on. Christian, thank you so much for doing this. In honor of you, I'm dressed like this. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's marvelous. Yeah, thank you very much for having the show and doing all this. It's, it's exciting that you oh, do it, and I'm honored to be here. My pleasure, my pleasure. Um, I thought we would start, of course, by doing a bit bi biographical before we get too philosophical. And I wanted to ask you about your early years. I know both your parents were, were artists and yeah. talk about how that influenced you early on and, and what your first musical influences were. Yeah, I mean, my first uh, musical influences were, as, I, as they have told me, I, I had a, an uncle, a great uncle, who was a, uh, the first person in the world who operated uh, a heart in 1944. So he was world famous uh, doctor or, or uh, yeah. And he played string quartet. And apparently I've heard them play string quartet and I said, now it's time for me to play. And I was like four years old. I don't remember that memory at all. But I do remember when I saw the Beatles for the first time, the film Help, and it just blew me out of the mind. And I'm, I'm still, I'm look, I saw the other day this phenomenal nine hour long Beatles thing by Peter Jackson. And I'm still like, it's, 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 my, it's in my DNA. Then I wanted to be like Ringo Starr. I wanted to play the drums. So I went, we went to the music school and they put me in a military band, which I hated. And then I said, I want to quit. But the, t doctor, the, the teacher said, he's very talented. He should play something. So I played trumpet. And then uh, I played trumpet in the military band and I hated it, so I stopped. And then, then uh, I, I was singing in choir, actually, in a very, very, very good choir, one of the best in Sweden, like boys choir. So like eight part boys choir. So I learned a lot about, about uh, this then. And frankly, I was not a very good uh, young boy. I was, I was very naughty and I was, was doing all sorts of things you shouldn't do. I started smoking when I was six years old and I was like, so, so, but at 17, I just was totally hooked on Jack Teagarden. Totally, completely hooked on Jack Teagarden. So we started a Dixieland group and I got Sven Erik Eriksson as a teacher who was extremely methodical. And in within one year I got into the academy and the next year I got a, a place in the Royal Stockholm Opera Orchestra. So it, it, that was my start. <laughs> that's a phenomenal start. What did you do to to progress that quickly? You said he was very methodical. Do you remember how methodical? Like, was he? Was it about repetitions? Was it about a, a time or a, a count or anything like that? How was it? Was, it was about it was about practicing three times a day, morning, afternoon after school, and evening, half an hour each and playing the Arban book and the Schloss Bay book and the Hansen book, just very methodically go through it with a lesson every week. And then uh, because I was so keen, I myself expanded it to six times a day. So I already then practiced three hours a day, which because I was, I, I, I always had a lot of energy. So I always did things 10 times more than other people. <laughs> so that's why I think that's why I, I it was so fast. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. And, and what do you remember about that audition? Was that I, it was probably your first audition that you took, right? Yeah. For the, for the opera orchestra. Yeah. I remember, I remember it very clearly. I had actually, I was in the Academy and they had an absolutely terrible teacher. And, and Sven Erik was, uh, we were not even allowed to go to Sven Erik uh, as privately. We were not allowed, but I did on the side. And then I also went to London to study with Dennis Wick for a month, mm -hmm. for five weeks. I went, before the audition, I went to London for five weeks, just practiced. And then I was so methodical. I practiced, I remember 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, six o'clock, eight o'clock and 10 o'clock again for, for half an hour and did exactly what I should do. 
And then I came and I played the Grendel. And apparently I was sort of completely blowing the, the competition away. But then in the second round, I played David. No, maybe the opposite. The opposite. I played David in the first round and I blew everything out, every, all competition out. And then in the second, I was, there were some people who thought I shouldn't have win because I didn't play Grandal so well. <laughs> so, so I had to actually two people in the trombone group that, that but all the violinists, all the, all the non-brass players thought, Wow, he's certainly got to get the job. But there were two people in the group that didn't like it. <laughs> uh, and were you guys close friends after that? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> one of them is dead. The other one is sort of become a friend. And, uh, and okay. Uh, yeah, he he was not. He was he was a very very thoroughly man, and he thought that it was crazy that someone who had only played trombone two, two years should be in, in an orchestra is too too difficult for me he, he it would be too difficult for me he said it's it's so, really phenomenal to think about somebody being so methodical and winning a job that quickly outside of jack tea garden what were you listening to at the time in those early years too as you've started to uh, well i listen i listened rostropovich was a was a big uh, I mean, he was he was getting big in Scandinavia then. It was like the Solzhenitsyn thing when he was bringing Solzhenitsyn to Sweden, and my parents were very involved in that politically. And uh, so, so I listened to Rostropovich. I listened already then to Alan Petersson, the symphonic Swedish symphonic uh, writer. What else did I listen to? Well, of course, uh, all the jazz and uh, a lot of Santana. Uh, a lot of Miles Davis, a lot of everything, I think. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, I think my favorite all that already then, as it is today, is Tchaikovsky. Yeah. Yeah, that's Which very clear. I, yeah, that's why I have this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's, my, he's my number one hero. Wow. Um, side by side with Mozart. <laughs> amazing. Yeah, and you conduct both of those composers quite a bit now, which will... Yeah, it's, it's uh, like heaven yeah. to do. How did... Uh, and I know you've... I, I've seen you talk about your parents before and the, their influence on you artistically early on. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of go into the things that they brought out in you early on that influenced you? Yeah, I mean, I mean it was like the whole family lived in, a, in an artistic... It, it was like art was the most important thing. And uh, other things were secondary and, and the rest of the society is always the total opposite. So art is like the last thing you ever do. Uh, and uh, so uh, visually, I still have that feeling. And my father was, uh, my father was extremely, keen also on, on encouraging uh, my, my solo career, I remember, because he was, his father didn't let him draw. He, he was, his father wanted him to become a businessman. And he, he, he broke with his father and, and they never really got, 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 uh, got on very well. So he said, I would never, never ever do something like that to my, ch my children. So he encouraged us a lot, me a lot. And, and it also, also he said that to be an artist, it's not only about art or uh, painting art, or it's also literature. And it's, it's like being intellectual, the intellectual side of it is extremely important. And I think that is the reason, maybe the, maybe the, the most important reason why I succeeded as a soloist. Yeah. yeah because you 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 do some you do uh, someone composes something and they are geniuses they are they are enormous and you as an artist has to understand their souls how they live what they are and everything and that has to be expressed to the audience uh, to get to get good reviews <laughs> i think yeah yes <laughs> absolutely what and and we'll to come back to your the the beginning of your solo career in a minute. What what do you remember about the short period of time in the opera, and where was it that made you decide you wanted to go to a solo route instead of staying in the orchestral track? It was one one particular. Well, it was it was many things, but uh, 
first of all, we played uh, Meister Singer. I remember it went into the to the ditch at six o'clock, came out at twelve thirty at night. So, and having played like a very exciting overture, waiting for thirty minutes, having two alcoholics uh, on on the third trombone. So we played one one chord which was out of tune. <laughs> so. My God, I, 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 was, I was so depressed that year. But the worst thing was because we made the world premiere of Ligeti's Grand Macabre, the opera. So I played all those, all those angel things. And, and I was absolutely super enthusiastic about this. But the rest of the orchestra, they, they hated it. They protested. They thought it was the worst. Third trombone player, he said, well, in the rehearsal, Ligeti came close to him and said, if he gets a little closer, I'm going to hit him. I'm going to hit him. <laughs> and he meant it. <laughs> so it was that kind of enormous. Oh, so when I said that, talked loudly about this, that I liked it, I was in a way outside, an outsider already then. And then I felt this is not for me. Yeah. This, I can't stand this. So I went back to the academy and thought either I change and become a lawyer because I was, I was interested in that thing. My son is now a lawyer. So <laughs> we're talking a lot about that. I, I saw his, his work and he said, would you have loved to do this? And I said, yeah, it would have been exciting <laughs> in one of those, uh, you know, what, what are they called? He's a prosecutor now, and they, they had the, yeah, uh, and uh, you see them argue, and it's like, wow, <laughs> very exciting. But then I decided, okay, or I go my own way. We started a brass quintet, actually, so I thought solo halftime, brass quintet halftime, but then the solo career just took off. And, uh, yeah, what was your original vision? Because Because you're really the pioneer of the trombone so uh -huh. rare and yeah. can you talk about what was your vision for what that looked like at the time and then how did it evolve and change as your career progressed uh, well my vision was super clear and i knew at 20 i knew because everyone told me you're crazy <laughs> every single one said this is not going to work dennis wick John Ives and uh, Peter Gain, everyone said, no, you're not going to make it. It's impossible. It's not going to work. It's no repertoire. There's nothing, blah, blah, blah. And I said, OK, if it's impossible, I got even more sort of motivated. And I said, I'm going to get I'm going to give it exactly 10 years. So I took the decision at 20 and decided not to play in an orchestra at all. Even there were so many possibilities to do extra things in the orchestra, but I thought that I need every single minute to evolve and to 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 really become a, a true full-blooded soloist. So I just worked very methodically for ten years, wow. and it took nine years actually. Yeah. Before that, it was like I was ready to give up when I was twenty-eight. I was really ready because there were so many obstacles, so many dirty things, so many corrupted things in, in classical music. You wouldn't believe it. Well, you probably do. <laughs> but it's, it's like, uh, it's even worse today, actually. Yeah. So, so but, but that, what happened was that, that Sandstrom wrote this motorbike concerto for me. And it's still like it's still a milestone in music because it was theatrical at the same time as it had all the ingredients of a concerto. And a year after that, I found myself. Everyone said, poor Christian, he's so brave. We will give him a little <laughs> something. Yeah. And of course, he, 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 we can pay him a little bit less than a violin soloist or a drum or a trump or a whatever. Uh, and then it came to a point when I got more offers than I could take. So the first time I said, no, I'm sorry, I'm fully booked. That spread. 
And this was exactly 1991. It was actually later than, than 10 years after. It was like in 1990. Yeah. Wow. I was 32, actually. Well, at 30, I felt I'm going to make it. Uh, but at 32, it uh, took off. You know, so I was traveling like 240 days uh, a year. Amazing. With four children, which was difficult. <laughs> and, yes, that would be very difficult. And well, so, but in the early time, you went back and studied some with uh, Roger Bobo and Ralph Sauer, also, and John, John Iveson. Can you talk about what that period did for you and then how that galvanized the rest of your soloing after that? Yeah, uh, I mean, that was that was early. That was very early. It was like when I was 20, 22, 23. Right. So I decided I made the decision 20. Everyone said I went to to John Iveson. He said, OK, well, you will always be a great musician, but I don't think you will make it. And uh, so but, but he was he was extremely good at teaching me accuracy that you have to, you really always have to be perfect. He was, he was like a, unbelievable. His attack was like always, and he never practiced a lot, but he always thought with his head that he had to be. And, and so he, he taught me really from being a little bit wild mm -hmm. to become a very, cautious player. Uh, then I went to America and that was a very good time where I had two different kinds of teachers. I had Ralph Sauer and Roger Bubu. Roger Bubu being the really wild guy hmm. and, and Ralph being extremely careful and extremely, and it was a very, that was in 1983. Three, I think, just before, before I won the competition, uh, a couple of competitions, and did my first CD. Yeah. Uh, so, so, and the, the what I have to say, give him him the best. The, I mean, a real compliment, Roger Bubo, because he he was the first to say, "I think you will make it." Wow. He said this. He said. Because I always ask them, do you think it's possible? And he was the first and he said, you know, when I was 23, when I was your age, I asked myself the same question. And I said no to myself. But today, I 100% regret that I did. So I'll say, you'll make it. Wow. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> what, did that, what did that do to your confidence and, and your, your thoughts? Enormous. It meant so much. It was like somebody, s s finally someone who, who gave me some, some hope. <laughs> Incredible. And, and then, of course, things took off from there. And, and at what, what point, I mean, it, I know it was early on, but at what point did you become close with Hokan and, and the two of you kind of forged these paths together? Well, actually, it's so funny because I met him when I had played trombone for, I think, five or six months. I met him at the uh, international, or maybe it was a little longer, but it's the first international brass congress in Montreux. Mm. And he was like a young wonder, wonder child running around with, with Doc Schitzer and all these guys and taking lessons with them. And I was a little old and didn't know anything about brass. And we stood there and we played those bozza equis together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> and then we didn't speak for a time. And then we met in Stockholm for once. And then we played a couple of concerts together. And since then, I mean, we've been, I just talked to him this, uh, like an hour ago, we had a, we had a chat about the, the life. <laughs> Did you tell him you were doing this? No, I forgot to tell him. I should have said, I, I'm going to, I'm going to write to him. <laughs> he, he was my last guest before you. I know, I know. It's stupid. I didn't say oh, it. No, but, no. Uh, yeah. But we were talking about, basically he was, we're talking about Omicron, of course. <laughs> Yeah. He had been, he'd just been in, in Berlin and I said, talk about, I started to talk about Omicron. I talked about uh, 
spot what problems with spotify because they have, it's it's very difficult when you have a recording company to deal with spotify and then i i told i recommended a very sad film to him and he said come on <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> i gave him finally a very good 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 tip for a film which is called special correspondence with with um uh what's his name <laughs> the comedian Eh, I lost his name. Ricky Gervais. Oh, Ricky Gervais. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think he's watching that now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, how, how did you, because you two were really pioneers at doing what you were doing. Because, yeah. I mean, of course, with Trumpet Pioneers, we think of Maurice André first, who did commission a lot of composers, but Hokan really took it to the next level as far as getting new music. And then, of course, there's the great video that you two did, A Night at the Opera. Oh, wow. Yes. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, you look the same. And uh, <laughs> so can you talk about that relationship and, and how you two fed off of each other as you both developed your careers? Yeah, we had we were we were constantly talking. I mean, he's in a way his path was more easy mm -hmm. because he was the second generation. I was the first generation. So, uh, uh, but still, I think I had some advice. I was a little, I'm, I'm like two years, three years older than him. And I, I gave him some advices over the years. He was very, he was always very interested in my parents' arts and the, the, the group that we came, the, the sort of the environment that, that we built. So we always shared a great interest in, in, in really great literature, Chekhov and, and Dostoevsky, and, and we talk about those things. And also artists, he was very, he's, he's very in, into that. So we, we, together we, and it was, it was important also because the overall view of brass players, which partly is our own fault, is that it's like, oh yeah, we have a beer and we have a playing just jolly things. And you know, these string players, they're so stupid. They play only intellectual stuff and so. So, so that image we have to rub away. Otherwise we, we won't get anywhere. Yeah. So that was that we talked a lot about those things together. Over beer. <laughs> no, over a very good bottle of red wine. <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, so in that early period, how did you become involved with all the recordings with BIS? When did that come into? <laughs> it was very funny because uh, my brother recorded already for Biz, mm -hmm. uh, and then he, uh, I asked actually my brother if he could talk to, to Biz if I could make a recording, and he said, no, no, I'm not interested in the trombone recording. <laughs> and then actually, uh, I, Hawkins sent a, an invitation for Biz, to a concert that we, Roland and I and Håkan did together mm. in Stockholm. And Robert com, com, came immediately because I had an offer from another label, a smaller label. So I did, I did a solo record already before my first Biss album. Right. And he went straight on to me and said, what the hell, why did you record for this label? You should have recorded with us after the concert. Right. And I said, well, you, you, you said you wouldn't. Well, now I will. <laughs> <laughs> and then immediately he just recorded this first the virtuous trombone yeah and that became of course a, a huge hit that was like jungle telegraph all over the world so he was he was totally he didn't know what to do with that and yeah. then we did the second and the third and the fourth and then and then he there was a point actually when i was uh, had offers from uh, from uh, philips and uh, and uh, these bigger companies who would offer me like classical trombone concertos and a virtuoso stupid thing and something else, which might have given me a, like a better boost in the beginning. And Biss was very afraid of that. Yeah. So he's, but he said, okay, 
I know I'm not them, but remember, I will record the literature that you want to record and I will record everything of it, all of it. They will not. Yeah. So I choose Bist. I choose, I choose David for before Goliath. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And how, yeah. how many total recordings did you make on BIS? <laughs> Over a hundred. Together with the con conducting things, because right. we, I did a lot of a lot of conducting also with them. And and which is your favorite uh, outfit that you wore? Is it the motorcycle trombone concerto or the one where you're the schoolboy? Oh, the album, the the, yeah. the 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 album. Yeah, the cover. <laughs> the cover, absolutely the one with the with you know when I sit on the chair. Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't know, what, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and that was so funny. That's my that's my favorite. And Roland Penton, and he's he has he is a man of a great sense of humor. When he saw that, that's the greatest album cover ever made and i <laughs> and i sent it to Biz robert and and the german manager he was he was so angry he said to Biz, we cannot accept such a cover on an album absolutely impossible so so robert was trying he didn't know what to do he said please can you change that out that cover on the album and i said no <laughs> I can't. <laughs> and it's out there and it's even even listed as as one of the five most ugly covers ever. Oh, no, it's not an ugly. It's a perfect cover. Oh, it's a perfect cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but but I mean the the most uh, what they have this list on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, I'm very proud of that. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's a badge of honor. It, it's no, a badge it's, of honor, but we made one even even more spectacular on the Nutcracker Suite now, on the, which we have on Spotify, on our own label, yep. where we are belly dancers. <laughs> so. Belly dancers, perfect. I like belly dancers. Yeah, it's very yeah. good. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, and, and you recorded so much repertoire on, on the BIS label. I mean, so much, and you had so much control over that. And you know what? I mean, it, it would be impossible to go through your discography of yeah. that. But there, there's so many iconic recordings, like you mentioned, the motorcycle concerto and the recordings of Christopher Rouse and Barrio. What are there? Maybe possibly two, or maybe three anecdotes you have of some of those recordings that maybe you people don't know about as much. <laughs> well, <laughs> I can tell one story. Which made the the the, the producers the, the second producer of this after, the second guy after Robert from Bar Robert Saf, he called me a, a genius after that, uh, because <laughs> what happened was that we were recording the Christopher Rouse no the the Chavez trombone concerto with the BBC Welsh Orchestra, and we were at the end of the session we were doing the last that was that we had we had about one hour left to to work. And I was doing a very, very, very long take. And during that take, it's still on there. That's a funny thing. It was a very good take. But in the middle of that take, I had been to Burger King there. And apparently there was, there was a very, very bad piece of meat there. <laughs> so after like two and a half minutes in the take, I just stopped went straight, I ran out to the bathroom and threw up for, and everyone was quiet. No one said anything. <laughs> and I threw up like hell. <laughs> and then I just walked back and continued where I were, <laughs> finished the recording. <laughs> and he said, that was the most amazing thing he ever, he had ever seen. <laughs> wow. And I was amazed, but that's, that's like, my mentality is like this. It's like no stop button in my head. Yeah. If I have to finish something, it's like, it's impossible. I, I would rather die than not finishing it. That's a, that's been quite dangerous sometimes. <laughs> you still eat at Burger King? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'd rather eat at McDonald's if I have to. <laughs> no, 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 no. I still eat at Burger King. Yes, it's good. It's good. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> well, and, and so where we're talking about these compo the, the repertoire that you recorded, of course, yeah. you've worked a lot with living composers. Uh, uh, Takamitsu, Rouse, 
uh, yeah. Gustavi, Thomas Luciani Barrio. Can you talk? Uh, at first, but the first composer we should talk about is John Sandstrom. So, yeah, Oof. I mean, of course. So, talk about the first time you guys met and and what that connection was like, and what in his music speaks to you and made you really latch on to him. Mm. I was uh, premiering my first trombone concerto ever written for me, Miklos Maros, and we were in Iceland. And it was a, a Nordic music festival for contemporary music. And I was not particularly keen on that concerto, but I played it and was very successful. And, and Jan Sandström, we, we met on the plane and I heard his piece, Era, a, an orchestra piece, and I was totally knocked out. Then we we went out, we were like youngsters, so we went out on the bars and drank all night, and then we went to the to the hot springs there, and we were discussing, it was like talking philosophy and music and everything, and it was so incredibly refreshing. It was like if modern music, we talked about all the, th the things that were bad with modern music, what was great with it, and what the road ahead was, and how to be keep being childish, keep being having music, and keep being in your soul. So there it all was born. And then we worked for four years on this piece, and it was premiered, and it was uh, like a bomb in the classical music world. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And you've recorded quite a bit of his music and, and conducted it as well. Of course. Oh yeah, oh yeah. He's my he's my best friend still, and he had he had a very tragic stroke a, a way, uh, to to one year ago or something like less than a year ago. And uh, and the strange thing is that he during that stroke he's now getting better, but he has his half side is. Thank God, his his writing hand and his speech is still there, but he had four dreams, four really nightmares, and those four nightmares, he said, I want to write music about those. So we have now there are now three orchestras that will commission this piece, and I will conduct it in two thousand twenty three, and and uh, there's a couple of other orchestras that that I've invited that will probably go on there. Yeah. And then also he has, we have actually with the, with the income from, uh, from uh, European gramophone, we have commissioned a new trombone concerto, trombone concerto number three by him for Gothenburg Symphony. We'll do it in the autumn of 23. Phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, that, now he's, he's, he's like, for me, he's the greatest Scandinavian yeah. composer. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. Like the output he's had, it was, it, and with Hokan too. Like both of you, have, absolutely. He, I think he writes two two trumpet concertos for him. Yes. I think two or yeah. three even. And yeah. and um, it, so talk about some of these other composers too, like Rouse that you you know and and yeah, uh, Rouse. I I never met so much, and that was written for uh, for Joe Alessi. Right. right yeah, right. but but, but uh, and he also recorded, of course. Uh, that was amazing, amazingly written. The, the, the one that I really loved was, of course, Takemitsu with St. Paul Chamber Orchestra did that commission. And, and after that, it was so funny because after the world premiere with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, we were, we were sitting all night long until five o'clock together, singing Beatles songs and drinking whiskey together. <laughs> this. Uh, old very distinct gentleman you know but very small and shy wow and we had it we had a great time oh so i i should ask you before i go on what what is your favorite beatles album uh, abbey road abbey road. abbey road is number one i think the best uh sergeant peppers is the next my next favorite and then uh, then there's songs bits and pieces here or there but i think those two are the real genius work yeah and then there's the songs like Fool on the Hill and, uh, and there's separate songs that I love. But those two albums, the last album, the, the Abbey Road, the, which they made, it came out before Let It Be, but it was made after, after this disaster that they actually had. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, I just had to ask while we were on, when you brought them up again, I said, well, we have to know what, 
what is your yeah. rank? Yeah. <laughs> where, where, yeah. where the White Album fits into all of this. Yeah, White, White Album, I think, of course, it's, it's, it has some weak points, I think. Uh, it's not as uh, solid as a whole album, but of course, the, all their songs are, I mean, amazing, 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 amazing. And, and Help was, like, of course, the one that, that hit me directly. Yes. And then Rubble Soul, I can say everything, but for sure, I have been asked this question. Abbey Road was there the crown of their work. Yeah. yeah, I think. Yeah. Well, and we still suffer through Penny Lane because of them. So thanks a lot to David Mason for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. David Mason did that. <laughs> so um, let's talk a little bit. Well, and I was going to ask about Luciano Berrio also. Oh and, yeah. Yeah. Well, how, tell tell a story about working with Barrio and and oh, how you guys oh there's there's so many great stories with him. Oh my god. But I I've got to tell the one when when because he was he was laugh I was I came to down he was going to write this piece and we met a couple of times in his big hotel suites when he was conducting. And yeah, I came in there he was smoking cigar and once in in, in uh, Amsterdam, I remember he conducted the the uh, uh, Orchestra, and we came in there, and I played motorbike for him, and he was just laughing his ass off. He thought, "Oh my God, this is so creative!" He said, "It's so creative. What what did what do you do here? What do you do here? How do you do it?" You know, he was over the moon for that, and then he even said, "Okay, I'm you know I'm writing an opera right now for the Salzburg Festspiel." For the opening of the Salzburg uh, Kronika del Luogo, I want to write an opera role for you. Are you free that month? And of course I was. <laughs> so he wrote he wrote an opera part for me. I was Abu Lafia, the 13th 13th century uh, prophet, and played on all sorts of things. And I sang also. And the funny, the most funny story with him was he 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 didn't get on with the with the. Um, uh, director, mm -hmm. which he wanted to choose another director, but they said, okay, we, we have this young guy we want to present. And the first thing Luciano said to me when I came down, they said, Christian, Christian, remember, if the director says anything you don't like, just refuse, refuse. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was like a war. And, and we had in, in the, this gross of, uh, what, what, what's the name of Gross of Freshfield House, yeah. It was even there in Aishua, the, the big, big area there. And uh, we had 600 journalists on the, on the uh, dress rehearsal without clothes, you know, the, the next to the yeah. dress rehearsal. Yeah. And uh, at the end of the opera, where everyone was going to applaud, he went on stage. Boom, 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 boom. And when people were starting to applaud, he said, stop, I have an announcement to make. I would like to thank all the soloists, the orchestra musicians, the conductor, you are all great, but I would like to say to you, and then he pointed at the director and said, you ha it has to be a miracle if this opera is going to be staged. I suggest we make a concert performance out of it. <laughs> wow. And then they started to hit each other. Physically? Even, yeah, physically. <laughs> But there was a performance. <laughs> so that's Luciano Berry. <laughs> you and Hokan in your interviews both have stories about fist fights. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. So funny. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about your, your composing, because that's a, just another giant part of who you are. When, when did you start to write? When, when was that an idea in your head to write? Well, when I, when I re realized when I was young, when I, that I was so talented and so fast growing into music, I was learning so fast. It was like, for me, also a shock. I thought I had this idea of becoming a composer too. So I started to study piano and cello and trombone and composition. So I studied like complete, uh, so much. It was incredible. I was like 
learning everything. I wanted to become a composer. And I wrote the brass quintet, which we played through. And I was so embarrassed. So I said, never again. Uh, and then I, then I actually had a psychosis at that time. I went into five days of not, not being able to sleep and I went into hospital for three weeks. Wow. So it was, a, it was a terrible time, but I, then I calmed down and I concentrated on trombone. So I said, I will never ever com compose. It was John Sandstrom when I was 39, who was, there was an orchestra that was gonna commission a piece from him a new trombone concerto, and he called me and said, Christian, remember, now you, you've written so, many, so much of the motorbike concerto, and you have written so much of the parts in other concertos. You should write, you should take this commission. I will tell the orchestra that you write it, and I'll guide you through it. So then I wrote Araben, and the next day I had two commissions, and then from those I had more commissions, commission, commissions. And I ended up in 2000, 2002, 2003. I remember I had like a, a, a queue of four years for commissions from Chicago Symphony Orchestra, from Rotterdam Philharmonic, from Australian Chamber Orchestra, Scottish Chamber Orchestra, all. So it was like, bam. Incredible. And, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm still composing. I just, I just, the last piece I wrote was a trumpet concerto for Pacho Flores. Yes, yes. Yeah, right. And that that had if, extraordinary reviews. I mean, we 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 just recorded it, and it's it'll be out in in on European Gramophone in uh, April or May. Now, what is your what's your process with how you compose? What what is your when do you get the idea? Do you sit behind a piano? Or is is there other things that come into play that influence you? What what's the process like for you to write a new piece? Well, when I wrote the first piece, I used uh, just paper, no piano, no computer, nothing, just from the head, and I thought it was very good to do that. Mm -hmm. The second piece I wrote, Mad Mandrick in the Corner, that was I did. That was to learn to write for a compo for a, for a on a computer. Mm -hmm. Then I wrote on finale, and then I started gradually going into different, trying different mosaic, different systems. Ended up with Sibelius, mm -hmm. and uh, of course Jan Sandstrom. He we we had many 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 lessons on how on technique, and that would take like four hours to go through. So I leave that too. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. sure. <laughs> But I, but I managed to find a, something that works for me. Mm -hmm. I start just by writing. I, I sit down, just sit down with the computer for exactly, usually exactly uh, 75 minutes and focus 100% on writing an embryo, something, just something. Doesn't matter what it is. When 75 minutes is off, done put it in, in, in there, and I write 24 of those, always 24. Okay. When that's done, I listen to them and see, take away one at a time, which are not so interesting. I end up with six or seven, maybe, mm -hmm. or five. And those are the core of the piece. This, this will be like what I build the piece on. Then I make a structure. Of course, it's, it's a commission, so it says 23 minutes trumpet concerto. Right. And then I look at these embryos and see where do I put them? Do I do a slow part beginning, a faster thing? How do I put it up? So I make a kind of form. Yeah. Decide on a kind of form. And then when that's done, I start from the beginning and usually write about. I make a schedule actually of like three, four months. Yeah. When I when I say to myself, I have to write average 10 seconds a day. So I sit for, and that's only part of cell so far. So I sit also for 75 minutes, something like that. And I try to write something which is 10 seconds. And then I continue from there 10 seconds next day, continue and I go back a little bit and I go to the end. And then it's that's four months. Then I go back to the beginning and make orchestration. Wow. 
also for four months. So it's like, a, it's a very, it's very technical <laughs> because, because I am a very, uh, let's say, uh, what do you call it? Like, uh, I'm a very eccentric person, very, very emotional person. So my mind can go away easily if I would go, it's like, I'm, so I, I have to be, to get something done, I have to be extremely strict. <laughs> well, I was just about to ask about that because any, most, many of us have seen your video on your day and how structured it is, but I believe it's actually true, right? It's true, it's true. It's not true every day. And it's like, it's like, it's true that I do it, but also the best thing with me, which I did when I did in school, I, I, I cheated, well, left away. I mean, I, I sneaked away from school and went into do bad things. I do the same. <laughs> I have my structure, but I protest from it once in, once in a while. <laughs> yeah, well, you have to, right? Otherwise- Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. Of course, but that, and when did that structure develop for you? When did you know that I'm going to be so busy and if I don't measure out everything I do, it's not going to work? Well, I think, uh, I think I was, it was like always when I had, I had this temperament where you start to smoke when you were six years old and I was addictive when I was nine. It's when terrible. You, when did you quit, by the way? Well, I quit uh, for the, the last time I took a smoke was at, at my weddings, my, my, my son's wedding, which was five years ago. But I've stopped all my life. I have stopped and started, stopped yeah. and started. And I was up at 60 cigarettes a day. So I'm extremely addicted to it. So if I take one sip now, I'll probably smoke three packages immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so that that is my character and i noticed that to get away to, to get something done i need a structure mm -hmm. i need my my psyche needs a structure and i find that found that out when i was in school and also with a with a trombone it's when eric taught me that and it worked very well for me and then i took it even further steps you know and from time to now i'm from time to time i have freaked out and had wonderful sort of things experiences of all sorts of things but i always realize that i've got to go back to there to to achieve my goals yeah and it's always always i mean we know you know you're a, you're a great trumpet player you know that Discipline is the only way. Yeah, <laughs> How boring can. it even is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have to make yeah. excitement out of the most boring of things. Which absolutely. Yeah. Which which also uh, leads me to uh, well, I, bef we, before we get off of the trombone subject completely, uh, and I'm, there is a video, of course, that you made during the pandemic of your warm up. You know, can you uh, yeah. can you talk about what it is that makes you get into the place where you're productive in your playing? What what do you do mentally as you approach the trombone to to make the boring things exciting in the front of your mind? Is there any process in that? Do you clear your mind? How do you how do you approach the trombone every day? To I do I do a lot of yoga actually, so that have helped me. I've done that through through life and and in the in my warm-up at times within that warm-up i've done yoga exercises so it's like uh, for me it's like always to do that first note to take the breath in and go to the f every single day basically even if i'm in a very bad mood it's it calms me down <sighs> It gives me sort of rest. And I know that I have 10 seconds rest and I go on and it's like, it's a very, very, it is like a ceremony, that warm up. Yeah. It really is. And, and, and every time I, I try to go away from it to try different things, it's been terrible. Yeah. I, I come back to this yeah. and always feel the best when I do that. Yeah. And it keeps you calm and 
It keeps me calm. And, and I also noticed many times that for me, you have to, if, if I should give advices to, to people, to others, to students who listen, you have to learn, get to know your own rhythm, uh, sort of rhythm over the day, mm -hmm. how you work. For me, it's like, I need to start nine o'clock. And I need to do two or three sessions of 24 minutes to be in shape and to feel relaxed. That's when I, when I get the most done of that. And yeah. then I have a place in the afternoon and I have a place in the evening. That's tried out. I've tried it out for, for 50 years now. Yeah. And it, it's, I know when I can practice to, of course, you go into periods when you have to do something special and then you practice all the time. But yeah. 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 But this is, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but then stepping back into the, I'm sorry, I'm kind of jumping around, but yeah, good. back into the composition, talk a little bit about your latest release, uh, Steppenwolf. Oh, it's, yeah. It's yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I, Liz, I love listening to it. And, and actually, from, oh, good. And, and most people probably don't know that that's not just a rock band. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, Steppenwolf. Wow, that was uh, yeah. It, it was a commission. It was a guy in, in a very fine viola player, <clears throat> Rafael Altino, who is the principal of the Odense Orchestra. Who the Odense Orchestra commissioned it from for him. And uh, I have not written a violin concerto yet, so. Viola was very good to come to the viola first and to learn the instrument. And it's, it's sort of melancholic tone. And having read Steppenwolf by Hermann Hesse, mm -hmm. then it's like, it, it has, just has to have this kind of melancholic feeling. So it's always like, it never really blooms out first and second movement. It's always about, I saw a film the other day called Moonlight, a very sad American film, one of the best American films I've ever seen. And it's like that kind of sadness where you feel like an outsider and you want to see, you, you still have all those feelings, but you're not part of the society. And it's, it's, it's hard to describe, but it, uh, it, I think it is, it catched the, uh, it did catch the soul of the viola because I got so many, I mean, everyone said that that many of the, the international reviews said that's one of my best pieces, which I don't think, but myself, but. <laughs> it's a phenomenal recording and. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Now the, the <laughs> melancholic uh, feeling from the viola, it doesn't have to do with their clef, right? <laughs> I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they feel like they're the outsider. Yeah. They're, not <laughs> they're not. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I heard also uh, when the, the time when I heard him play was the Berlioz, this Harold in Italy. Yes. Right. Which is also, I mean, also for, for being, I mean, Berlioz was also a very, he was bipolar like hell. Yeah. And he was, he was. And this is like the sad, the really, really sad Berlioz. And when I heard that, I was knocked out because it's not really much to do with the viola. And it influenced me a lot. And also Bartok, uh, while viola concerto also for the last movement, I think was very, very big influence on me on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, no, it's, it's fantastic recording. People should really check it out because, um, <laughs> And I also want to say too, like your composition style, you've written in many styles, jazz styles, uh, you know, like you said, chamber music. I love the the tuba concerto you wrote for Oystein. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who by the way, is just, nobody will care about this, but when he was very young and I was a student at Indiana, somehow he wound up in my dorm room eating pizza. He probably won't remember this, but it was it was I was like, hey, do you want to grow grab some pizza? And he's like, sure. And he, you know, yeah. Harvey was still teaching there then. And, and so, oh, yeah, and, and wonderful. Got, yeah. And and I just remember Oystein eating pepperoni pizza in, in my range. <laughs> but all these pieces, what um, where do you draw your influence? I mean, you mentioned Miles Davis before. I mean, mm. where, where would you say you draw in 
some of the chamber music influences, some of the jazz influences. What what do you what are your sources? What are your go tos that that you constantly come back to? Uh, it's like I feel I feel like this. It's like my brain is the input of my brain is a lot of music, and I feel that I have it there. It's Xenakis, it's Berio, it's the Beatles, it's ABBA even. It's, uh, it can be, of course, Miles Davis, Coltrane, uh, Rostropovich, Tchaikovsky, everything is in my brain. And it, I try not to think. I try just to sort of deliver something that comes out, which of course is something that is a mixed influence of, of everything. Yeah. And you go into things, but, but if I start to think I'll write in that style, you, you lock yourself in, your brain is, is locked and you're not free. Mm. So what I do when I do these embryos, that's a ve very important part of the, of the very critical part of the composition because I try to be totally free and what comes out there has to be there and I put it away. Yeah. When I come back and look at it the second time, I can see what it is. Is it valuable? Is it me? Or is it copied too much of something else? And then I throw it away. Yeah. Is it something that is new compared to that never been heard? Wow, this is something interesting. And that's how it works. Yeah. So that E6 that I choose is usually something that I want to be uniquely me. Right. Whereas it's not because it's a mixture of everything. <laughs> Well, this is actually a perfect segue because I know that you've talked so much before about the arts and, and what that means as far as dance and literature and oh, yeah. philosophy, paintings and all these things, and how they assimilate. Can you kind of talk about your process with that and, and how much you you're very well read? You know, you're very much an art connoisseur, of course. Uh, and yeah. My God, my God. I mean, I couldn't I couldn't have been so creative at all without having read. Balzac, Lost Illusions, uh, the, the Brother Karamazov, Kafka, the whole process, process America and the, the castle, uh, Chekhov novels, having seen the, the what is it called, the seagull, and, and all, those, all those things, having seen those things, and Strindberg, the Swedish author, you know, he, there's so much influence there because you read those and you had feelings out of this. And particularly I wrote a, 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 a percussion concerto, which I think maybe is the best. It's not played so often, it's been played. It's, it's there, there's a young guy in, in Germany who had, uh, have, have, have put it out on, on YouTube so you can find it there. But it's, it's extremely influenced by Kafka. It's called, uh, Mr. Hammersmith in heaven. And it's about the man who looks on, down on his life from heaven. And it's like, it's also theatrical. And, and yeah. so, yeah. so it's all, all taken from Kafka. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, because so much of your, your, your composition, as well as your trombone playing, there's theatrical elements. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, is, is that something you studied with somebody? Did you get an acting coach? That's just all just you. All just me, but but of course every time I do it, I I get uh, advices. Mm -hmm. I mean that there are there I have a lot of theater friends, and they say that it's of course unique me. And then but then of course I learn I learn that I have to have a good speech and everything, and yeah. and that. But I think it's very important when it's music theater. It's very important to keep it from not going into professional theater acting. So it's right. like, yeah. <laughs> it stays, so it stays genuine as opposed to trying to be- Exactly, right? exactly. Like that's- Like important. if they try to fake playing an instrument, it's the same kind of- That's thing. right, that's, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> which, which we've all cringed when we see movies and people play the trumpet on the valves of the left hand or something horrible like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 that's <laughs> true, that's true. <laughs> um, so, yeah, those all those things come into play, um, and the, of course, this all the other aspect of your career is the conducting. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so when did you go to the dark side and how did this happen? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really going to the dark side. No, my God, it all happened this way. I learned everything by memory. And in 1997, I came to, was going to do, I'm not going to say who, what it was and, and so on, because uh, some people get, might get embarrassed. But I had this very modern piece and I was faced with a conductor who couldn't do it. And we still had to do it. So I had to be polite to the conductor and still get it to work. So I started to give all the entrances and, and everything. Like, you know, and oh yeah, yeah, it's working fine. And no one looked at him uh, at all. And, and then there was like, it happens very often actually. But in yes. this particular case, the orchestra came to me and said, wow, you are a great conductor. Well, <laughs> thank you, but I'm not a conductor. Yeah. Uh, and then, then uh, they talked about that all evening. Yeah, 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 it's okay. And then the next morning they called my, my British agent and they said, they want you to come and conduct. What the, what the heck is this going on? No, 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 no. It was just a joke, I said. And then they, then they called my general manager and said, no, no, they really want you to, to conduct. But I'm not a conductor. I don't want to conduct. And then they kept asking. And I said, OK. I thought, OK, give me three years. And uh, I'll come in October 2000. This was 97. And then I started to study with all the conductors that I worked with as a soloist. So I started to study and we made a program that would work well. So I did that and thought that that was, that was it. And uh, then I got a phenomenal re review in, in the, in the uh, Guardian and uh, in London there. And then I came back and two orchestras, the Nordic Chamber Orchestra and the Swedish Wind Ensemble, they, they asked me if I would come and conduct them. Yes. And immediately after the first, the, for, for, for both those orchestras, they offered me to be chief conductor. So I said, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My God, why did I? <laughs> <laughs> now, many times I thought, why did I do it? But uh, I was eight years with those two orchestras. Uh, and then the, from 2004 to 2012, in 2009, I was offered a completely new orchestra, the Nordic, uh, the, the Norwegian Arctic Philharmonic, a full symphony orchestra. Yeah. And I led them for 10 years from 99 to 19. And after, in the middle of that, I got Israel NK Orchestra, 2016, an orchestra which sadly now is killed. They just killed it. They just fired all musicians during the pandemic. It's, and it's, it's a catastrophe. It was the best orchestra in Israel side by side with, uh, with uh, Israel Philharmonic. So it's a disaster. That, so that, that's, that was my career. And, and then I've, I've guest conducted everywhere and and it's a, it's a very strange job. It's a very strange job because it's, it, quite, it requires a lot of different things. And particularly I was, when you are, it's, it's also a very dirty game because there's a lot of, a lot of uh, manipulations from certain agencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's like, I would, I would even call it a cartel. Yeah. That runs everything. I was in within this cartel, and I just couldn't stand it. So I I have left all the managements. I have my own little little firm, Araban Art Events, and does everything from there. Orchestras love it that I do it from there, and uh, and that's that's where I am now. Is it possible this this orchestra in Israel will come back? No, I don't think so. But, but well. They were all offered Jerusalem Symphony. They all offered them jobs. 27 of them took the opportunity. The rest of them went elsewhere. Uh, I don't, well, they're still fighting and they're, they're still doing sort of the, the, 
the gigs that they were doing within the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra Foundation. Yeah. We'll yeah. see. I mean, there we, we, we had a we had an amazing relation. I had an amazing relationship with the musicians. Uh, we loved each other. We had we had tours in, in Austria. We we did a tour in Spain, we did a tour in Scandinavia, we were going to Fonseca, but we were going everywhere. And they just killed it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> well, this is, and this kind of brings me to sort of the final question I was going to have, which was, was obviously the world is a very tumultuous state with this pandemic, with the, the, the politics and the, the extremism, all the, all these situations. And, and this is sort of a broad question, but what do you really view? Cause you're such an artist. I mean, as a, as a musician, as a, I don't, I mean, as a trombone player, as a conductor, as a composer, um, what do you view the role of artists in our time? Where do you see, how does that fit and how does it make sense of the chaos that we deal with? Ooh, how, uh, yeah, that's a question that I ask myself every day right now. I mean, I mean, I, I feel it's extremely fortunate in the position that I am, where I have, I'm, I'm for the first time with a recording company. So I would say thank you to the pandemic because thanks to that, I managed to create a recording company that goes very, very well, even though it's very difficult times for, for recordings. Right. So right. I have that, I have my own management. I have possibility to be a, a a music director for an orchestra. There's there's a couple of orchestras are offered me already the, to take over. But so I have I have different ways to go, but I have no idea, specifically the last days since uh, Omicron came back and they they my Japanese tour was canceled again. I just felt okay, where do we go? Very difficult, but I think. I think it will come back the same way, but even stronger. It will take one or two more years, but once we get out there, we're going to be so sick and tired of just seeing faces like we do now yeah. and long for hugging, being in the concert hall. So this is going to be, I think, enormous. I, I mean, when I was in the quarantine, after having not having a concert in six months and came out in Taipei to a society free from COVID because they were at that time with a full hall of, of 3,000 people and a full orchestra doing Bernstein biggest pieces. I was like, wow, this is the best thing that can happen in life. So I think we, we'll get there, we'll get there, but not now. Hopefully Omicron is a little bit weaker than the others and the next one is a little bit weaker. We, people are, are, are insane enough to understand that they should get the vaccine. And then, uh, then we'll, in 2023 will be a great year. I think so. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Christian, hold on just one second, but I wanted to sign off and, and thank you so much for doing this interview today. It's a real honor to have you on. Such a great hero of mine. And uh, thank you. And now even great show. You. You're amazing. Uh, you're just saying that because I did my collar like this. <laughs> Partly. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was so much fun to talk to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Hold on one second. And thanks for everybody so much that watched. I really yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, everyone out there. Keep keep, keep keep playing and believing in future. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.